Hi, I'm Caroline Powell, and some of you will know me from our relationship with St. Peter's through the warehouse. Um, I'm just so thrilled to be with you all during your, your Sunday worship time to be able to explore the Word of God together, especially during this month of August, which is Women's Month in South Africa. I'd love to start by remembering and acknowledging what Women's Month is all about for us and the, the different ways that, that uh, remembering this month in this way makes us feel often as South Africans. We remain extremely grateful and encouraged to, to celebrate this month in memory of the women that came before us, those who with great courage and clarity and creative resistance um, stood up to the evils of apartheid in their day and left us with the women of South Africa with an immense calling and legacy to continue resisting oppression in all forms. And so it's in that spirit that we also remember that we we remain those um, together, men, women, and all people of South Africa, um, uh, those, uh, especially those of us with the faith to, to see all people created in the image of God, that we remain called to resist those oppressions. And so this month also becomes a time of remembering and lament as we as a society, both locally and globally, still struggle so deeply with violence against women and children and really everyone who resists the forces of domination in, in the systems of our world. So it's with that spirit, both of remembering and celebrating and lamenting and and calling to to more action that we gather together to to worship and to read the word of god together at this time so thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to do that with you the title of our time together this morning as we explore scripture is going to be do you see her and it's linked to the story of jesus and a woman in luke 7 um, Luke chapter 7 verses 36 to 50. I first encountered this, this term, do you see her, just a few months ago with a community of people that um, I'm helping to organize a, an urban consultation of, of uh, justice practitioners in South Africa and Africa. And they have called this gathering that's happening in October virtually across the continent and world they have called it, Do You See Her? And they have linked it specifically to the story in Luke 7. And I was so interested and compelled when I when I um, heard this question, Do You See Her? Because it's not one that I've normally naturally noticed in the story of Jesus and the woman in, in Luke chapter 7. And so I wanted to invite us into this, this, this Bible study together. We did it the other day with the community of staff at the warehouse, and it was a rich time of reflecting. What I'm going to do really is help us read through this chapter together with a few different lenses and then pose a few questions that you can reflect on during this time and that hopefully you will even feel like you might want to gather with a few people in the course of August or later this week, perhaps get a few people online onto a call and explore these questions together and keep reading the story and allow God to illuminate new insights from it to your heart. So let's start by reading this, this chapter, chapter, Luke chapter 7 verses 36 to 50. And as we read this first time round, I want to just ask you to, to think about the question, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, what are the things that come to mind as you read this, this passage together? You might also think of things that you have, I mean, many of us who, who read the Bible have, would have heard the story many times. And so you might think back to other teachings, to sermons, to discussions, to things that you have thought about as you've read this before. And so I encourage you to allow those to come to mind and just reflect on it as we read together. I'm going to read from the NIV version. And from chapter 36. The, in the NIV version, the, they have given this, this, this section of scripture a title, and they've titled it, Jesus Anointed by a Sinful Woman. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him, and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so, this seems to be a story about a room full of men, gathered together, eating together, socializing, perhaps discussing important things. And the men, many of them, are named. We who read the the text together know who they are, and because we know of other uh, references to to many of them in the scriptures, we, we know their significance and, and, and what it means to be those, those men, including Jesus. And yet this story becomes about an unnamed woman and an unidenti- unidentified sins. And so what I would like to invite you to do is to take your Bible, it doesn't matter what translation it is, and read through this passage again, slowly, from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. Read it through again slowly, and as you do so, um, reflecting on what you first noticed as you as you read this, as I read the, the 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 text. Now I want to invite you to have the following questions in mind as you read this through slowly on your own, and there are three questions that might help you have some lenses as you read it again, and the questions are about shifts or movements that we might notice happening during the story. The first question is, is there a shift in people's posture, their physical positions, with relation to each other during the course of the story? The second question is, is there a shift as people's private thoughts or um, feelings even, become and, and their own concerns that they're keeping to themselves? Is there a shift as those go from their private thoughts to become public expressions of all the people in the story? And then the third question is, do you see a shift in power dynamics between the people in the story as it unfolds? So have a slow read through the story again and think through those three questions. A shift in people's posture and physical positions with relation to each other. A shift in people's private thoughts becoming public expressions. And a shift in the power dynamics between the people in the story. 
you will want to press pause on your video as you pick up your Bible, read again and consider those questions. I hope that that was an interesting exercise for you, that perhaps as you went through the passage again, uh, you saw new things maybe uh, as you went through it. We know from the introduction of the book of Luke that the writer of this, this book really wanted to lay things out clearly for, for the readers of the book. He says in the very first opening sentences, um, I, ha I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning and I decided to write an orderly account for you um, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And so that is the intention of the writer of the book of Luke. And as we read through the book from beginning to end, we notice that the way the writer has uh, described the events of the life of, of Jesus and the people in, in Jesus' world around him, those who follow him and those who respond to him, we really do notice that that Luke becomes the book of great reversal. Um, I use the words shifts and movements that we just see in this very short snippet of, of scripture. But we see so many shifts and movements in the book of Luke. So many reversals and things turning upside down from the way they were. And perhaps you were able to see some of those things happening in this chapter as you read it with those lenses. I want to now invite us to reflect a little bit more about one of the characters, the one who um, is, is quite centered in the story and the one whom the title of, of, of this, this Bible study is, is centered around, the, the woman, the unnamed woman. And this question, do, do you see her? Well, before we do that, before we um, answer Jesus' question, do we see her, let's, let's reflect a little bit on how, how we see her. And to do that, I want to invite you into a short reflection again. Um, and for this, you, you might want a pen and paper. I want to invite you into a short reflection on this concept of sin. So again, would you, after I've, I've shared with you what I, I, I think will be helpful for us to do, you'll need to press pause on your, on your video in order to spend just a few minutes doing this. And so I want to invite you to write... Take a few minutes and just write a long list of things that you understand to be sin. Our concept of sin has been informed by our family, our history, the country we live in, the, the, the culture we are part of. About uh, It's been informed by Christian teachings over many years, um, biblical input. Um, and so just think about all of those things and then just without thinking too much more, just write a long list of, of things that you consider to be sins. So how was, how was that? I hope that you took as, as much time as you needed to reflect on that. Uh, if you still need a little bit more time, you can press the pause button again and continue with that exercise. But now I want to, to offer um, another lens to think about this. I recently discovered a contemporary translation of the Bible called the Inclusive Version. And you can look that up online. Um, the Inclusive Version Bible uh, was was written uh, with the aim of trying to transform the patriarchal and male-dominated language of most of the other translations of the Bible that we've had available to us up until now. Um, and so it's a, it's a fascinating read. If you can get hold of, of reading the Bible, it's the same content, it's biblically um, very well translated and uh, very sound, but what it does is it, it moves through the Bible from beginning to end, addressing how language has been used to center a patriarchal system. And so when I read Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50, in the, in the inclusive version, I was fascinated, firstly, to see that they do not use the same heading that, that we had um, in the first reading that I did today. They do not uh, speak about um, Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. 
And then during the, the course of the story, instead of referring to her as a sinful woman, uh, the writers of, of the, the inclusive version translation of the Bible refer to her as a woman with a low reputation in her town. And so what I would like you to do now is, again, press the pause button on, on this video and go through the list that you just created about, uh, with a long list of, of things that, that you understand to be sin. Go through that list and highlight or circle the ones on that list that would lead a person to have a low public reputation. And so as you finish doing that exercise, I, I hope that you again have found that interesting. When I went through that exercise, I was really struck that so many of the things that I had considered to be sin were things that I wouldn't be publicly punished for. They were not things that perhaps even anybody knew about, and it certainly wouldn't be anything that would bring me a bad reputation. Something that I thought about was the sin of hoarding money and of um, being uh, ungener not, not generous or of, of being part of a society that keeps money to ourselves rather than sharing it. And um, often in, in my, my experience and my culture, though that kind of behavior, um, the saving and, and, um, and keeping money for the future is actually doesn't bring a bad reputation. It actually gives you a good reputation. And so I found some of those, those uh, insights to be quite interesting as I went through that exercise. And I hope that that you did too. It made me think about the characters in the story and what the woman in the story who had been carrying the burden of this huge public shame, being known as in history as a sinful woman. In some translations, it speaks about an immoral woman. And yet everybody in the room, as Jesus points out, um, has has sins that that need to be forgiven and i wonder whether the point where he makes about those who have have sinned much or forgiven much whether actually he's he's not pinpointing that those whose sins are publicly carried um, and and carried with a, a sense of public shame when when they are released from from those debts and those sins they they receive so much more freedom whereas those of us who keep these our um our sins in god's eyes private may not receive the same kind of liberation and redemption and so i want to invite us just at the end of this this time together to reflect on what all of this might mean for us in south africa in 2020, in August, which is Women's Month, where we reflect on the things that I spoke about in the beginning. So think back on the story as we read it the first time round, on the reflections that you had as you read it a second time, and the shifts and the movements that perhaps you saw in the story, the shifting power dynamics. And think about what you wrote down about sin, and what you also might have thought about a low reputation private sin versus public shame. And as you think on, on those things, I want to share six questions for us to reflect on. And again, I, I as we're not in community having coffee together after church, this might be something that you really would like to do with a small group of people um, in the course of the next week or month. So here are the questions that we could think about for our time and place in South Africa today. Who is Jesus asking us to see in our world when Jesus says to the Pharisees and to, to the people in the room, do you see this woman? Who is Jesus saying to us, do you see this person? The second question would be, what has been our opinion of that person that Jesus is asking us to see or those people? In other words, what is their reputation in our society? Or are there people who we have allowed to carry public shame for our collective sin as a society? I particularly, particularly think about people who are in prison, uh, criminals, people in the criminal justice system, 
um, people who are caught up in um, the, the sex trade in our cities and how they carry the burden of such a low reputation. People who have been drawn into the cycle of organized crime and and um, the the industry of drugs and and the the gangsterism that comes along with with all of that and just the the systems that are at play there, the, the public shame that so many of those people live with our family members and friends and and neighbors in our city carrying the public shame for our collective sin as a society um, that still lives with so much inequality. But who are the people that you reflect on as you answer that question? Where is Jesus inviting us to shift our posture towards one another? What might need to move from our private thoughts, good or bad, <laughs> um, into public action, where we are harboring unforgiving or judgmental thoughts, where does it need to come out in confession and repentance or even restitution, justice, that could eventually lead to reconciliation? Where, like the woman, are we carrying years of shame that need to be poured out in front of a loving God who will release us from the debt of carrying that shame? And finally, where are we being invited to see shifts in the power dynamics between us, in churches, in society, um, and as a South African community? So I hope that those, ref those questions will help you reflect a little bit more as we enter Women's Month and we try and work out uh, these, these, these really tough moments in our, our life as a country together. Thank you for the opportunity to, to delve into scripture with you, I, and I really welcome any reflections that you have. I'm sure that uh, we can share uh, my email address and contact details with you, and yeah, we'd just love to invite you to, to reflect more together as, as you learn. May I end with a prayer? Dear God, who hears the cries not just of women who have been oppressed, but of all who have been shamed publicly for carrying our collective sins. We ask for you to help us to see with your eyes, to enter every room with your posture, to expose every injustice with your wisdom, and to love each other with your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.